My name is Ray Bonilla, and welcome to another episode of Studio Bridge. I am super elated uh, and honored to uh, be joined by uh, my guest here, Julie Beck. Um, before I start, uh, please like, if you see this video, like, uh, like it, that'd be great, and subscribe, consider subscribing. It really helps out sort of the outreach for the video. So Julie, um, Thanks so much for for having me uh, interview you. This is awesome. You're agreeing to do this. Of course. I mean, I'm always happy to obviously talk with another fellow artist, uh, but I'm always happy to chat and have conversations online like this. Or it's it would be even better if you're here in my studio, but um, this will do. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I know. Um, so I, uh, yeah, so I, I, did some research before uh this interview and there was this uh one interview of you and ryan brown um in your studio and i was like oh man i wish i was there doing the interview in the studio that was a pretty cool looking studio but um you know you're 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 always surrounded by a lot of like amazing stuff including so for those of you wondering that is not a green screen in the back background that those are actual casts uh <laughs> So, um, so Julie, tell tell us, um, I guess, tell us a little bit about about you, just who you are now, and then then we we could talk about kind of how you how you got there. Okay. Um, well, I am an oil painter. Uh, I've been an oil painter for about ten years. I was actually an acrylic painter before that for about ten years, uh, and my work tends to focus on narrative still life, symbolism, some surrealism, and I also do a little bit of figure portrait work. Um, but yeah, in general, uh, I'm an artist and I'm also the assistant director and an instructor at the Academy of Realist Art Boston, which is an atelier style school where we focus on teaching uh, the technical side of drawing and painting, uh, mostly observational drawing and painting. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, I have tons of, uh, I, we're going to, I'm looking forward to diving deep into that because I, uh, have a uh, love for for you know atelier training, especially from from that lineage. So, uh, but uh, so, how did you? I mean, I'm really interested to see, like, just to hear from you, how you actually came about, you know, getting to Boston and getting this sort of training. Because you're you're originally from Western New York, right? From uh, mm -hmm. um, from the Rochester area, if I'm correct, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. So, I mean, like that was, I mean, Rochester, maybe in the turn of the century was like, you know, a town of a lot of artists and, and things like that because Kodak was around and it was like the heyday of that. And um, for those of you who don't know, Rochester, New York, that was like the home was, is still the home of Kodak. But when they were producing, you know, when people were using film, uh, not as like a cool party a treat, you know, but actual <laughs> like uh, everyday use, they were, uh, it was the town. It was a place to be um hmm. so how did you did you do your school in in that area or did you leave uh, as soon as you you went to college i yeah i was raised there i was born there i grew up there and then i needed to leave as soon as, soon as possible uh i i just didn't really want to stay around. I just felt a little restricted. Um, I also got a full scholarship someplace else. <laughs> so that was, oh, nice. um, I, I, um, I went to college in Rhode Island at Roger Williams University. And I had actually went for uh, originally structural engineering. And then I ended up with oh. a math degree there. So um, I really wasn't like an the art person. I wasn't surrounded by a ton of artists. I actually didn't think being an artist was like a viable career and neither did my parents. And <laughs> now they uh, have a different uh, tune. But uh, yeah, I, I we kind of all agreed that maybe I wasn't super natural at art like I wanted to be. So I went into the engineering uh, direction and I got a full scholarship to Roger Williams University, which I absolutely loved going there. I actually, I really did like the engineering part and I liked math and I like math and science a lot. I think there's a lot of overlap actually into what I do now. Uh, but 
I going to Rhode Island really got me out of what, you know, I was near, near the geography where I was raised and uh, really opened my eyes to just even other people and things like that. So uh, I'm a big fan of going away to college. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. So, me too. That's yeah, actually was, how I ended up in Buffalo. Um, yeah. Uh, because I'm from Queens. So I actually did the reverse of what you did. You went from like, you know, like a small place to kind of a much larger place, uh, you know, in relatively speaking. And then I went from a large place to a, a yeah. small place. So yeah, I, I, I get it. I get it for sure. So how did, were you looking at art at that time or was there like, how did that start? Uh, well, because like I mean, you, you think like with math, was there like an art program there that you were taking art classes in or? There was, um, it was a very, so it's a great school for engineering. It's a great school for architecture. It was a great school for marine biology, but it was one of those colleges, a liberal arts college in which the art department had like one teacher for all of the art classes. So like one guy taught every class, but it was a lot of fun. It was experimentation. It was, you know, I would do sculpture. I actually have a sculpture minor and it's just because I had enough credits for it. But I think throughout my, the electives I would take, I would always take art electives because I really obviously enjoyed um, being creative and I enjoyed uh, making things with my hands. And so it made sense to be taking those classes for my electives. And I always enjoyed the painting classes. I liked, you know, welding too, but I, I always kept coming back to painting. I remember painting in high school and loving it. And then I'd be painting in college and I would just be creating on my own without really this thought or intention that it would be like a career type of thing. So it was more because I wanted to rather than like it being more of a career direction at that point in time. Right. Yeah. I guess like that's how everyone kind of falls in love with, with art. It's just like the process itself is, it becomes really addictive and being able to kind of produce something from nothing is just like this unbelievable experience and just uh just as a pure joy you know uh i think it's uh, like <laughs> yeah seriously right it's like it's pretty unbelievable yeah. you know and if people i mean like on a side note from that people uh like always come up to me like during uh, like a get together or something like that or you know they uh um introduce to someone i don't know at least one once a, once every event i get someone that says like you know i i did this paint and sip event and it was i know it's not really art but it's you know it was really fun i says you know no i mean like i get it i get it i was like wasn't it super interesting to come, you know start from nothing and you get something at the end of the night and it was a lot harder than you thought it was and it was like completely different from what you thought it was going to be like i mean that's literally what we you know we artists go through um every single time that's what like got us addicted to you know making art um so so after after the math degree i mean um did you did you work uh, in in the field or uh, uh applying it or so what happened sort of post college i mean you had you had a sculpture minor and and a math degree i mean uh yeah i had a you know. an opportunity after college as i was approaching the last year of college I had an opportunity with uh, a company that my parents worked for. They were like, "Hey, we can we can see if there's an internship available because it was in they lived in Rochester and the company was all over the place, but there was a branch in Rhode Island." And they said, "Hey, we can see if there's some internship opportunities for you." And one of them was the actuarial department, and the other one was the creative services department, and that was a pretty obvious choice for me. Uh, and so I just said, well, it's just for the summer. So I'd like to try the creative services to see what that would feel like. And I actually started out working in the prop room. So believe it or not, a creative services oh. department, they would do conferences in which they needed uh, big props because they would have themes and they would create sets and costumes. And there's other paraphernalia throughout the year that needed these more fun, interesting things. So the guy who ran the prop room needed help. And so I actually started out in my internship, like sewing outfits for like a large Snoopy stuffed animal. <laughs> so I would like wow. make a briefcase and uh, I would help with conferences and creating these big sets. 
And uh, I would look around and in the creative services department, there's also graphic designers and editors and they were doing film. And I had a really amazing boss at the time. And I said to him, I said, is there a possibility I could also learn some of that graphic design? Because I was like, ooh, that's kind of creative. And he right. said, absolutely, here's your first job. So I was really fortunate to have somebody who was who was happy to help develop, you know, a person. And so mm -hmm. I got the opportunity to start learning graphic design. And I was able to get really in-depth with Photoshop and Illustrator and eventually video editing and motion graphics. And so especially as that kind of came uh, developed more digitally versus the typical film. So I, you know, I know my way around a computer and they needed people who could start doing video editing on the computer and things like that. So it was a really amazing opportunity. And now I hadn't planned that when I started the internship, but for somebody who wanted to be in some type of creative field, that seemed like at least a step closer. I mean, obviously I wanted to be a painter, but that seemed so far away. So it was almost like a step, a side step towards creativity by saying, hey, here's some skills I can learn and maybe have a career in a design or art, art related field. So I was right. really, really fortunate. And then I ended up, you know, being a freelancer for them and other companies over the next like 10 years. So my twenties were all spent doing freelance work um, and doing design work and video editing and, and motion graphics work for um, a lot of different uh, organizations, but then also, you know, painting at night when I was tired from working, I'd come home and paint. Wow. Wow. So, um, so you were, you were like, basically like Final Cut Premiere, like uh, After Effects. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow. That's yeah. uh um that's where I got I got my my uh initial uh my bachelor's degree in that. And so it's because oh, wow. um, I thought that that was like, you know, the the and it would give me the most the broadest range of skills to kind of apply to and like I mean I, mm -hmm. I graduated around that time like uh two thousand and five. But when I came in it was like in great you know great need because it was like basically the early days of i mean of youtube and i mean it's really crazy to think that all that stuff came and then like all this need came from that because everything was going online like in a serious way um yeah. but that's and that was wow. like, so that was actually you, a really incredible way that the pandemic now i had given up all that stuff like years ago, but then all of a sudden the pandemic happens and it's like, I was so thankful to have those skills because it helped us integrate all the stuff the school does, but all a lot of the stuff that I do and be able to work, still work with people and use those video editing skills, the motion graphics skills, like the design skills, like the familiarity, like really helped in terms of making sure that there, we didn't skip a beat once everything kind of shut down. Right, right, right. Because I mean, you you have to, I mean, doing a freelance, you have to kind of learn how to work super efficiently on it and guide a, guide a client from point A to point B uh, with everything. And um, that must have, yeah, I could see where that would have came in super handy, you know. Uh, and yeah. and you, you said you were painting at night? Uh, as well. So did you, you take painting classes? So you say you took some sort of, you dabbled in painting in, in undergrad. Were you taking any sort of night classes after, or, um, you know, after that point in, in Rhode Island? Yeah, I, so I would always, I'd have to like save up money because I didn't have a lot at the time, but I was saving up money to take classes. I was really fortunate to have RISD in my backyard uh, unfortunately, I think the classes I was taking, they were, I think, geared a little bit more towards people who, you know, weren't looking to deep dive into a specific skill. They were a little bit more casual. And um, so I actually became incredibly frustrated with a lot of the adult classes that I was finding around Rhode Island. So I, you know, this is when Etsy first started, I had joined Etsy and I was like selling $50 paintings on Etsy and just doing a lot of self struggling, self taught stuff. There really wasn't a ton of resources online. 
Uh, but the continuing ed classes I took, so for example, I took a still life painting class and I would go home and I would do the assignment and I didn't know how to control oil paint. No, there was no actual technical instruction about oil yeah. paint. So I would go home and I'd have like oceans of solvent <laughs> running across the board. I would right. have no idea like how to get opacity with the paint and what brushes to use and what brushes do what and what, you know, what colors to get or why to use them. So I would, I would come in with something that I thought looked like total garbage. And I would be like, this is what I did. What, what, how do I make it better? And the teacher usually just said, it looks great. And that's not what I wanted to hear. I wanted to say, okay, yeah. here's the issues you're having. This is why it doesn't look like the way you want it to look. So I, I thought maybe I'm just not good at that. Maybe I should be an abstract painter. So I took an abstract painting class and then I kept getting yelled at because I made things look like things. Like I try to like invent something, but it always ends up as a thing. So that should have right, been my first right. clue that I wanted to be <laughs> more representational. So yeah, we all know, we all know them as, as teachers, the most effective way to get students to do something is to yell at them. Of course, yeah. you know, so <laughs> I know they're like, you keep making it look like a tree. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know what else to do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, oh, that was, God. that was incredibly frustrating. But so a lot of, uh, most of my efforts were spent at home with like, like a thing in front of me and trying to like make, I ended up going to acrylics because acrylics are a little bit more, I would say easy to like enter into, right. They're yeah, just walk. Oh, yeah right? There's easier. So I would, I'd use acrylics and I sort of learned how to wrangle the acrylics and I could like sort of make, I could make that thing look like my canvas sort of. And it, you know, there was, I was definitely like kind of bumping up against my own natural capabilities, which was not great. So I just kind of like, that's where I was for about 10 years, you know, like I got right. to the point where I could like kind of do a complex object, but that was about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, uh, my, my background sort of like going into, I always loved representational, uh, work and, you know, came from comic books and things like that, but some, a lot of my classes weren't formal training in undergrad. So it was, it was just like, you kind of just sort of do it and then see what happens and that could be frustrating at least i know for me it was like if i had a success or a failure i don't know why it happened it just sort or of how happened to so it. like i was at or how to repeat it right so it was just yeah. like okay this why is this piece good and then the next one was horrible it was even worse you know and uh but you said you were selling on um etsy i think we have a mutual friend in justin uh, vinning oh um, justin yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I told him I'd I'd, I'd uh, mention him, uh, and he had he had uh, texted me in uh, on uh, Instagram. It was like, what? It was like, you know, Julie. And I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a like, small oh, man, world. Representational art is a small world. Yeah. So, but you, I mean, you were on there on Etsy early days, uh, uh, pushing out that work. I mean, that's. I mean, is that? I mean, not not many people do that. I mean, it's you know, like say like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just sell the work on online. I mean, and, and you were just training yourself from observation. I mean, were you looking at any sort of books that you were able to pick up or was it just more so like, just, struggle. you know, just, just, yeah. just struggle, struggle, struggle. I, you know what? I didn't, I didn't even know what like books to look at. Like, I didn't know, I don't right. know the names of any artists. I didn't like know of any artists. I would like find a blog here and there. And you'd see stuff yeah. in museums. And so it's like, I don't, I, I just didn't, the selling on Etsy was really, was just kind of a way to say like, I'm making all these little things, like maybe I can monetize it in some way. And, you know, sometimes I would do like invented things. Like I would do these little like bubble trees, like every, like people loved these little bubble trees, or I would do they were almost like folk art because it was almost like I didn't know how to paint at the time. So I was like, well, I can like kind of flatten the shapes and make these kind of folk art um, 
custom home paintings. And those were very popular, <laughs> but I, I really was just kind of, again, forcing through, uh, you know, why does this not look like that and figuring out like why, or what, what to adjust about it. And they're really, I didn't have a ton of resources to like learn how to make it better or how to, right. or, or even like, I, it kind of frustrated me because I didn't even know what direction I wanted to go and create creatively because I was so focused on like my technical skills and making the thing look like I want to are, are still like incredibly challenging. Yeah. I, that's, I, I can, I, yeah, I know what that's like too. It's, and it's so, it's so horrible because you, you want to do, you you want your art to do something, but for you, and there's a connection that you have to it, but just a technical hurdle of just making something, I think that's, uh, and making it appear the way that, you know, yeah. uh, you want it to look like, I think it's super frustrating. So you, you had, I mean, were there any artists that you had admired? I mean, at the time for me, it was like, my art education was, there was a renaissance. This is basically like the summary of it was like, there's a renaissance. Cool. <laughs> and then, then impressionism came at, for really quick. And then modernism came and then yeah. boom, there you have the rest of contemporary art world. So there was like nothing in between. Yeah. Um, so it was like, if you wanted to do people in togas, you had like a source, but like outside of that, the only thing I had was like comic books. So w was there like any art that you had that you were been like, I want it to look like this, this is where I want to get, or like, this is a, a milestone I want to hit um, at that time. Um, or, or was it just like, I would say, I mean, I had, okay. My, my, the pinnacle of what I loved was Norman Rockwell. That was when mm -hmm. the art that I saw, it was always like, I'd see a poster here or, or some illustration there. And, and what Norman Rockwell could do in a single image, I thought was just mind blowing. Right. So that was the, that was so incredibly amazing to me. And so the, the, the idea of even making something even close to what, even close to like what that was like, it's so complex. Like one scene yeah. is yeah. so complex. Like I, I, like I'm trying to do a cup. Right. And it right. just won't work. And so like, it wasn't, that wasn't, that was like way beyond like my thought process. Um, but right. what I did do was I, there were some like the, I don't know if you remember the painting a day blog that was happening or oh, like, yeah. I, yeah. like Sarah Sedwick actually was, you know, her and yeah. uh, Carol Marine. And so yeah. they, that was really inspiring to me because they were doing good work quickly, which was again, mind blowing to me, but there was right. these artists. Dwayne Kaiser, I think was one of them too, uh, mm -hmm. where I yeah. see yeah, them yeah. and they were like, they were almost like my role models of like, okay, if I could just get to that, like, that would be amazing. Just being able to make these beautiful, colorful and dynamic pieces, it, you know, and you could see they loved what they do just by like, you know, how often they were doing it. Um, right. so they were kind of like my, I guess I would call it like my short-term role models, like the Norman Rockwell thing seemed so out of reach right? right because you're like <laughs> right <laughs> right yeah i mean he's yeah. like mm, you know am i really gonna yeah. get there and all you, all you of course all you see is the the end product like there's like right. no real information <laughs> about any of it right and yeah. you you told at least i was told like early on i mean later on i got into illustration history and stuff at the tail end of my undergrad but uh like you just kind of told like oh there that's norman rockwell whatever and it's like it's like you mean this person here like what what am i supposed to do like is there any other information like no 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 yeah. other information yeah. and i and i also have you know, so. uh, i have a i always joke about my like lack of art history knowledge <laughs> which it's like embarrassing honestly because i run an art school but um i <laughs> i i learned i know more now but i when i kind of yeah came into like, okay, I'm taking painting a little bit more seriously now, like towards the end of my twenties and like in my, like your general, like high school knowledge of like, there's the Renaissance. Right. right. There's impressions. Right? Right. Like that total surface, like the three things you learn in high school art class, right. that was like the depth of my art, art history knowledge. Right. And right, I have like right. a little bit more, but I am not 
a scholar. <laughs> I, I like I like to say that I have friends who act as, as like my other parts of my brain. Like my friend Eric's my materials brain and my friend Garrett's my like art history brain. Like I just have that outside to pick from. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I mean it, it so, does I mean, so help, like it does, it does. I the, my disclaimer is it actually does help when you're trying to work on creative ideas or you're trying to like source like another way of looking at something uh, like, so for example, self-portraits, like looking into how artists have done self-portraits in the past is really helpful because it will spur different ideas. So I do deep dive into specific elements of art history when it relates to something I'm currently working on. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, you're not, I mean, you're not giving yourself enough credit. I mean, you know, a lot about our art history now. I mean, now as a professional artist, I mean, I see it in, in your work, the lineage of, of artists that you're, you're kind of, you're referencing all the time. Um, so, but like starting off like that, that's, what's so tough about it. Unless like that's, you're exposed to it. Like you're starting off, not starting off with much, you know, if you don't run into into it you know and right. uh so like how how did you get into like go from that to the atelier training um was it did you well, go so you went to i, I know you, you you okay so you had moved to so you moved to boston from from rhode island yeah uh, I, I moved i moved to boston uh i believe it was 2011 it was um my husband at the time oh he's still my husband <laughs> my husband uh he was working at Brown and then he got a job opportunity at Harvard. And so he actually commuted for two years from Rhode wow. Island up to Cambridge, which was ridiculous. But we decided that it was finally time to take the plunge and move up here. And I was a little worried with freelance work because I'd be doing it remotely. But obviously now we know that's actually not that big of a deal. So I was working right. remotely. But when I moved up here, I started seeing if maybe there was better classes up here. And when I was right. searching around uh, Google at the time, <laughs> back in the day, when I was uh, when I was up here doing Googling searches for art schools, you know, obviously there's the School Museum of Fine Arts and there's uh, uh, there's a bunch of schools up here. There's mass art and everything. Right. So when I started Googling that, I would actually go down a couple pages. I went down a page or two and the Academy of Realist Art Boston showed up and I just clicked on it. And I'd never heard of atelier training. I had no idea it existed. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was a thing. And so I clicked on the website and it was a super old website and there was like one or two pictures on it. And it was like, well, that's interesting because that looks really good. <laughs> and wow. I came for a tour and I, it was, it was absolutely mind blowing. Like the minute I always do, I always do this thing where like when the elevator opens, right? It was the elevator opened and I, you walk into a room and literally right in front of the elevator was a wall filled with paintings by students and instructors. And I said, I, the second I walked in, I said, if they tell me that I have to shine their shoes in order to make work like this, I will shine their shoes <laughs> because awesome. it was exactly wow. the skill level that I aspire to. And so I like this, that's within that five seconds, I walked off that elevator. I was sold. Yeah. Isn't that like, I, I, I had that feeling too, when I went to art school, um, you know, for, uh, for my master's, uh, and it's this, like, you look at work that's so impressive that, and it's not someone that is in a museum. It's like a real person. It's not right. It's like, there's this sort of, yeah. I think when you when you are in a place where it's uh, where the artwork or like the 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 training is not at at the type of training that you want, and you know people that are doing it aren't doing it to a, like this really high degree, you just think that those people are long gone and they they just don't exist in this world, right? It's just sort of this thing, you know, and you or it might be genetics or something or something ridiculous like that. Right. But then when you exactly. actually see people, it's like, uh, it's here, it's here. I, you know, I knew it, I knew it existed yeah. the whole time, yeah. you know, and you walked into, I mean, Boston's got such a crazy history too. Um, 
of of just artists running all through that. Um, and it, it's interesting that like uh, uh, ARA, it existed in that sense because it's not, um, I mean, Sydney Macmillan started the school, if I'm correct, right? Um, uh -huh. And so when, when did she, when did she started, uh, like, did she start it around that time or was it, uh, did she start it like, uh, how many years was the school going? She started the school here in Boston in 2009. So it was two years before oh, so. I, yeah, she was fresh. So oh, wow. she, okay. she just had recently graduated from, she not only finished the, there's a, the Toronto Academy of Real Estate. She had completed that program, but then she had also completed her master's at the New York Academy of Art. She is a big right, supporter okay. of education and she thinks education is so incredibly important. So when she was living here in Boston, she decided that it was important to her to open up a school, partially because she didn't really see anything in this area that was this um, this type of training to this level. And so she right. opened up her doors in 20, 2000 and nine and she started with one floor in this building we're up to three floors we're like slowly consuming the building but wow. she started it with a couple of students uh and her and one of our current instructors named garrett batanza so she's just started it with the two of them and uh it's been here ever since wow and so and that that lineage is from michael john angel if i'm correct, correct. right Yep, he had so, originally then, started the Toronto school, and then I think they split ways. And but the curriculum and the processes and a lot of the terminology and a lot there's a lot of like kind of foundational information, which is common throughout a lot of ateliers. But I think mm -hmm. we go back to like he started the Toronto school. The Toronto school kind of became its own thing. They kind of evolved a little bit. And then when Cindy came here, we've evolved since the start of the school too. So we've actually adjusted our curriculum and our approach just slightly based on, we also have instructors who have other experiences. So we do have an instructor who has experience with the Florence Academy. Uh, and we have uh, an, an instructor who has actually uh, an abstract background. So we've kind of tweaked some curriculum because we think that for our student base, we find that certain things just work better. And we just have like tried to evolve it to make sure it works for everybody here. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes total sense. That's, it's like a, like an echo of the Boston painters, you know, like uh, the fact that like, like you have people like um, Joseph DeCamp and, um, and Paxton, you know, all, all operating in, in Boston, but they were, they were so like Frank Benson and, and DeCamp, like they, I think Benson studied in Munich or something like that. I mean, right. And then Paxton went through the, the lineage of like Jerome and mm -hmm. they all ca kind of came together and was this Boston school, but then they kind of, uh, you know, uh, evolved from that. And so, and then like, you know, packs into Ives Gamble and like Gamble, you know, kind of took it and did his, his thing with it. And then that, and then like those, those painters just kind of went and spread out, but like it, it never, I guess the point I'm making is like the, it's interesting the way the uh, learning goes is that like, it's never kind of like this pure version of it. Right. Because I'm it sure like be. Michael John yeah, Angel was, I mean, um, uh, was it Agononi, right? Is that, that who had, um, yeah. I think taught, uh, right. And so like Agononi is like, you know, it, I'm sure it wasn't like exactly what, you know, uh, he had taught that Michael John Angel was uh, teaching. And I'm sure that that kind of evolved, evolved through that. So like, it's like, I mean, it's always you know, ARA an almost feels like a new Boston yeah. school. Yeah. It's, it's always an evolution. And I, I always find it so interesting the that kind of, um, the lineage and how, how that information kind of spreads, uh, about, because I noticed that there's a lot of, um, color work, uh, that you guys do in this school that, you know, so maybe some ateliers don't necessarily, um, uh, emphasize uh, as as much there's like a style to you know there's an, a, a sort of a, a concerted approach and so you hmm. you had learned that's that's what so you started taking those classes I mean so like they had you starting out with bark drawings and stuff like that and um, I mean how was that because like the Charles Bark program when, when 
I I came about run I ran into it through a good friend of mine's um Neil Asami who knew Graydon Parrish and they were good friends. And so Graydon talked about the book that he was working on with Gerald Ackerman. Yeah. And we he showed me it, you know, this book. And I'm thinking, like, I'm like, what is this? Are you kidding me? Like, what is this thing? Uh and the fact that there was, for those of you who don't know, there was uh, back in the 19th century, um, there were courses, drawing courses uh, that uh, really were designed to kind of teach good taste and good design to like high school students, you know, and prepare them for the academy. And um, there was a need for another type of course that was um, clearer and easier to kind of understand and get a person from point A to point B a, a lot more efficiently, more or less. And so uh, Jerome, uh, John Lennon Jerome, uh, who was, you know, one of the most popular artists uh, in in Paris at the time, was at the was commissioned by the government, and he worked with this lithographer by the name of Charles Bark to create this drawing course. And that drawing course, uh, you know, and it's funny because it's that drawing course. I think that's that's the thing about it. It's like uh, that drawing course specifically was it was super popular uh, that um, it sort of stood the test of time, and it sort of made its way into the ateliers. And so you were you were uh, like, and so when you came to it, you were copying actual plates from from that book right because the plates are like 18 by 24 if i'm not not mistaken the well so we right? what we uh -huh. use yeah so the original ones i believe were at that size correct um right. and the 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 barg course in, in the barg plates um i think their original intention was to teach taste and and this approach to drawing uh especially sight size which uh, to me is um wonderful. Um, I think the, and, and when we're talking about the differences between like the lineage and the evolution of it, it just really comes down to who's teaching it and what their priorities are. So I think a philosophy that, that our school has really focused on is using the barg plates mostly as a form of exercise in which we feel like the concept of um, trying to instill taste really isn't our job. Our job is to give you a tangible technical skill set. So we do really like the bar drawing because it helps to isolate skill sets. And we can be very specific about, okay, so our first project is going to be these simplified, you know, the simplified bar drawings where they're yeah. really obvious light and dark patterns and simplified, right? So we use them as stepping stones of information and stepping stones of technical skills. And so we try to ensure that we communicate to students that while yes, we're using these as exercises, we don't believe that they should be dictating specific taste in art. Um, a lot of our instructors like lots of types of art, including abstraction, expressionism, and all types of work. And so we try to make sure that people who come here understand that we're learning skills and not specifically saying this is good or bad. Uh, it's mostly just used to like learn those technical skills. Yeah. And, and like, there's, it's interesting that they're, the great thing about them is that they're designed to go from simple to complex and all the answers are kind of there. And so you can kind of, they, you know, it's all about kind of learning how to take something complicated and breaking it down into manageable steps. And that, that like yeah. blows my mind because as a student, before I was exposed to stuff like that, I didn't, I just thought that it just sort of happened. And so yeah. that, that was what you got, right? It's like from from the first like, you know, scribble, it was like perfect, you know. And meanwhile, like you're having like, you know, all of these yeah. um, you know, uh, uh steps that you're having to do. And you realize like all the artists who, you know, around that time didn't necessarily um maybe take the the bar course. I mean, there, there were other ones, but it was all predicated around that teaching that that same idea. Um, mm -hmm. so like you were learning process at that time. I mean, how, how was, that must've been like thrilling to you that you were like being able to show, be shown like, okay, you start at point A and then if you follow this, like through, you will get a really good result. Um, yeah. I mean, that must've felt like incredible. Um, 
it felt like it, it almost feels like a super me. yeah it almost feels like a superpower right and right. so i when i first started i quickly realized i didn't know how to draw so, yeah. <laughs> so, so before yeah. that you know i'd done a lot of tracing or i would done like you know anything i did draw by eye the perspective was always just a little wonky and it was like okay right. but i quickly I, I think that's what can be really challenging is when when people come in and have a lot of experience it can be it's you have to put check your ego at the door you just yeah. have to or you have to be say i'm here i need help <laughs> and if that's okay that's I think that's what's really challenging. You're used to going to a class and and like the teacher telling you you did a good job. That's my job as a teacher is not to make you feel good about yourself. My my job is to make you learn something so you can feel good about yourself, right? So when I first came in, I quickly realized I didn't really know how to draw, but this method, this approach from simple to complex, so many people it come that maybe comes naturally to, but if you don't have a process already, it was something that it felt like it gave me a superpower because I didn't have to be perfect from the start. I didn't have to be amazing from the start. It wasn't that I had to know everything right away. It's always like, okay, you just got to start and you have to make a few marks and then you have tools to assess it and then correct or adjust and then continue to move forward. And that was just magical and absolutely, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid right away. It was like, <laughs> I said, I said the thing that I, when I, whenever I hear this from people who come through our school, but, or even just somebody I talk to in general, and I give them some advice or, you know, give them some feedback on something. And I come to them later, the thing I said, and the thing that is the most gratifying to hear is when somebody says, I can't believe that I did that. I can't believe that I am capable of this. That is the pinnacle of what is so gratifying about teaching this type of information. But also I was feeling that when I was, even within the first semester or two, I can't believe that this is actually what I'm capable of. And that completely flipped my idea of if art for me could actually be a viable possibly money-making thing or like just a career or be a, like more quote unquote serious about it. Right. So once yeah. I was actually, oh, wow, th that was me. <laughs> I did that and I can do this on my own eventually, but obviously I need some help along the way. That was like, that's it. That's, that's, that's the ticket. That's it. Wow. Wow. And so how long, how long were you there for? Uh, well, how long did you do you teach? I mean, um, obviously, take classes uh, for until you felt like th this was like a, you know, a launching off point uh, for your career. I, honestly, like within the first semester, I, I mean, yeah. the reason for that is because number one, I was always I was still painting on the side, like like in in our program and in most, well, maybe not most, but like in maybe our stretch of uh lineage of curriculum you have to draw before you're allowed to paint so i already knew like it took me six years i was working full time but it took me six years to finish the program and that's because i would be working full time but also taking a class at night or being able to like isolate a day and take classes here but i'd also be painting on my own after taking an oil painting workshop from somebody here who actually taught me about oil paint and what to do with it so using that information and just the information I got from the first semester, it I I would do this little five by seven painting of a little bird. And I was like, okay, here we go. This is this is freaking amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. That's I was awesome. like, I drew it myself and I painted yeah. it myself, and I was like, <sighs> Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I. That's like, it's uh, I, to paraphrase like Richard Schmidt. Um, yeah, uh, he had said like, when he learned his skills, he felt like he was like a gangster with a, with a brand new Tommy gun. You know, like you know, it was, it's just like <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like <laughs> just like what else can I do? What else can I do? You know, uh, yeah. Exactly. I was, uh, it was yeah. It, it, yeah, that was the catalyst. That was the catalyst. And that's I was like, awesome. and that was like, I was like, I don't care how long this takes. And I, I also think that's why I'm a really good salesperson in a way for the school is because like, I get excited when I'm like, wait till you see what you can do. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I mean, so like <laughs> after, after six years, I mean, you, so you went through all the whole gamut of like still life portrait figure. Um, I know you're, you're mostly known as I mean, you, you do everything, you know, um, the stuff that I see that you emphasize is, is still life. Uh, of course, if, if that's fair to say, um, mm -hmm. when it, when did you, how did you kind of arrive, uh, to that, uh, to that subject matter? Or was things kind of in flux at first, uh, or was it love at first sight? Um, that's a good question. I, so through training, I mean, still life is just a part of our program. So, right. uh, but so is figure and portrait and things like that. So I, um, I kind of had a, um, hatred for painting the figure <laughs> simply because it was so hard. Um, yeah, yeah. and I learned a lot with it, but I could tell like, it wasn't something I was like super passionate about. Like people come in here and they're like, I just want to work from the figure and portrait. And you can kind of just see it in them that they really love that. I, Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I was one of those people. Um, when I was going through the program, I, I felt like still life was something that was naturally just the, it was like the puzzle, a puzzle piece that was like working for me. Like I, I really enjoyed the setup. I really felt connection with the intention of a piece. And that was even through the academic pieces Like you know, academic pieces aren't usually that exciting, but I think that the, um, the range of possibilities with still life, I think are untapped in a way, but I also think it relates to like my personality. Like I just, there's something about objects and the space they they take up, but also the stories we kind of, inf the, the stories and memories we infuse in objects, objects become a part of our lives. They become symbols and they're so, um, they're so filled with personality without an actual person being in it. And I do think that there's like a heaviness when you include a portrait or a figure, there's an added layer of psychology that I almost, I feel like sometimes gets in the way, right? It's, it's yeah. so heavy with focus and intention and person. Like you've got um, ethnicity, you've got skin color, you've got gender, you've got uh, roles in society. So you've got a lot of complexity in which it can get kind of, it can get complicated in terms of what you're trying to get across. And I think that there's kind of this new, not neutrality, but there's, there's a more accessible language and there's not like a you versus me or the thing versus me. It allows like total accessibility to the, the piece because there isn't this maybe added extra psychological weight to it that I will do portraiture figurative if I feel I have something to say about like social commentary or something happening in the world or representation that I feel like needs to be out there. So it almost feels like I need to make it or do it. But the still lives I feel like are just open, open season for me. And so that yeah, within the academic like program, the still life, the still lives, I could definitely feel that happening as I was approaching my more academic pieces. Uh, but the, um, yeah, I was, I was never like in love with my figure paintings. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the, that's the wonderful thing about getting exposed to all of them. Right. I mean, it's like you, you kind of gravitate towards, towards a specific one. And that tends to be the one that you excel at because you're spending them most amount of time or that's the one you, you could tolerate the the most um and uh yeah i could see that i mean your your still lives are are such in a, in a way that they are they're very narrative um and have so much that they're like figurative multi-figurative compositions but well of inanimate objects um yeah so i mean like uh i mean they're it's good you don't have to they, they compose unlimited you know amount of time they don't need any breaks which is really great uh yeah and you don't have to and pay them they, and you have to pay them yeah at least at least <laughs> once it's like a one-time buyout right you know yeah. uh and you know it, it and then it allows you to uh it, you know in your case um 
pain from life, right? I mean, because that's, I think, uh, one of the things that, um, at least I found when I was, you know, uh, learning how to draw from and paint from life. And I, you know, uh, I tried everything like, um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, site size I uh, tried and uh, comparative measurement and all those systems. And I, I like love, I, I just love that type of stuff and learning about why. But one thing about site size too, and, and that, that type of training is that you really fall in love with um, uh, you really connect with your subject and you really understand and fall in love with kind of the, the visual phenomenon that you're seeing in front of you and how to go about interpreting it. Cause it mm-hmm. takes, it, isn't it really interesting? It's like, it's not copying, you know, and yeah, as much as you, you know, like when you thought when, at least when I first came into, to, you know, a training like this, you know, I didn't know anything. So I just thought like, oh, the best copyist always wins. Like the person that can like copy everything wins. And it's right. such a, you have to like unlearn and how you think about or how you see the the entire world. Because like what you're seeing in front of you is just this um, thing that is just layered with biases, right? Like that you don't even know you existed, uh, but they're just in, you know, informing everything that you're seeing. So like when you you know, ask somebody who's never drawn really all that before, like studied like this to draw a chair, they'll draw a symbol of a chair. And you're like, that's what a chair is, you know? And it's like, well, no, no, that, what about that chair? You know? And they don't even know things like, uh, I, I remember coming out of my first head drawing class. Um, Cause I kind of did things backwards. I took like a head drawing class first and then uh, did still life, you know, uh, around the same time. But well, the head drawing class was first in the schedule, is what I was saying. Um, but I remember coming out of it and just learning about form and cast shadows, just a simple, simple like principle. And I remember like the drawing that I did that day was like I was just stunned. And my teacher, Bill Mom, was like, Are you all right? And it was like, I didn't even know any of this stuff existed. I've been walking around, you know, like I knew the world, you know, at 20 something. And I realized like I haven't seen anything, you know? Uh, I mean, that's pretty common uh, when I, when when we start people with orientation here, I try to infuse a little bit of philosophy about it. And I say, you know, we're not just here to, we're not here to teach you to draw. That's not what we're teaching you. We're actually teaching you how to, uh, not teaching how to see, we're trying to allow you to see what's actually in front of you. So it's, it's more of being, it's learning what to be sensitive to and the things that we filter out on a daily basis. So it's in a way, just being more conscious of, and being able to identify, uh, things that, um, identify the things that you, that you're not used to noticing or seeing and how to communicate those within the language that you're using, whether it's pencil or charcoal or paint, like you said, it's not, it's, it, the common misconception is why don't a, why don't you just take a picture or B you're just copying. And those are, and that's understandable. Granted, we, we both know that those are kind of ignorant statements because you, if you aren't familiar with what we actually do and what we're actually training, that seems pretty common. That's like a very like lay person um, understanding. And I, it's completely understandable why people would say that. But when you start to understand that your language, which is paint or pencil or whatever, is actually not possible to copy. Copying actually isn't possible because you have a stunted language, you have a compressed language. So your job as a creative, as an individual, is to take your perspective, to take your priorities, to take your sensitivities, and then use that to interpret and to express, right? So we're in in a way it could be uh, very hyper realist. You're trying to create the exact illusion of reality. That's a form of expression. If you're trying to take that same information and modify it in a value range or modify it in color, and you're trying to express something totally different, it's it's a it's a language. You know, the language of of vision, and it's it's a way to 
um, interpret and uh, present your view in a way. And it's really like you have to open up your view possibilities in order to do that to the fullest extent. Yeah, it's really it's really like sort of taking the blinders off, you know, um, and, and understanding that what you when you see something like, you know, a Jerome or, you know, a, a you know, Celia Bow, to see a bow painting or whatever, you know, um, you're seeing someone's vision uh, and how they interpret things. Cause it's like the information is there. Like it's, it's really interesting because they're at a point where like, they were at a point where the information was there. They were picking and choosing what they wanted to, to show. And mm -hmm. it's hard to get to that level unless you know the stuff exists in the first place. And, um, you know, so the, it, 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 I, that's, that's why I like, I, I love that you had said that it's like sort of you're, you're giving the person, the students sort of the, and you've received it yourself, you know, like the kernel of like, okay, this is, this is like the kernel of information here. This is, this is how I am being able to make my, you know, uh, sort of open my eyes to the world. And then also better the connection and filter that into my hand and um, do that and express that in different mediums. Um, and then what I do with it after that is kind of up to me. Um, and so uh, the, it, it, you know, and that, that the great thing about that is that like, if you wanna, if you got sick of still life tomorrow, right? I doubt it, but you know, just based off of how, how much you, you're so good at it, right? <laughs> um, but you could be another painter, you know? And that's what I, I always like thought about that. Cause I, at least when I was a student, I was like, oh, well I have to sort of center in on this one thing. And if I do anything different, I don't know what else, I don't know what's going to happen. I, everything's just going to, you know, Armageddon's going to happen. And, um, you know, you realize like, it's not like, you know, this is how you draw a tree. This is one thing, or this is how you draw an eye, or this is how you draw a face. Like they're all kind of connected to each other uh, because everything's based off of light anyway, right? And so, and the effects of light on form that if you wanted to do something different, you're taking those principles, you can go ahead and do that. And um, it's and actually funny that, that you say that. It's funny that you say that because literally, this I every Sunday I work with three kids in the morning and the the lesson we just did on sunday was okay so here are those principles of light which is you know the plane closest to the light is the brightest the shadow families have to be different than the light family like these three the three top rules that we kind of talk about and yeah. and then i said all right i'm going to set some fruit out in front of you and you're going to make up where the light's coming from and given these principles create something that you don't see right in front of you, but make it believable. And so all three of them took a bunch of different objects and was able to take these three simple rules about light logic and form and create something that doesn't exist. And that's the beauty of those tools of being, you know, take them out when you want them, use them when you need them, use them to create something that doesn't exist. And then you, then you, the limits come off. You don't have to only work from life. You don't have to work with what's right in front of you. But if you have those skills and those tools and that knowledge, anything is possible. Yeah. And that's, that's super, super empower, empowering. Um, and, and something that, you know, can just sustain you creatively. And I think that that's, at least for me, it's like, uh, you know, I mean, you're, I think artists um, are just obsessed with making stuff, you know, <laughs> and as painters, like, like I have to paint. It's not like a, yeah. uh, a thing that I could kind of turn off and being able to do that long-term, I think is, uh, you know, a matter of like being able to set that up for yourself so that you can can do that and experiment and learn how to do that and learn how to grow as an artist is is super powerful because you could you could turn it could turn bitter really quickly because you can get tired or plateau um, really early on um, because of that. So you're what when, when you had a uh, when you had sort of decided, okay, this is it. 
did you start to restru- restructure your life uh, so that you could kind of make that happen? Uh, or um, was it like a hard stop? Because I, I mean, I've met artists that were like, I called up my job, my, my, my clients the next day, and I'm like, I'm not doing any more work. And I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's bold, you know, and it worked out for you, but, uh, you know, um, <laughs> but so, did, but, but is that, is that what happened with you or, or was it like a sort of a, 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 a constant, a consistent sort of drawdown? Uh, uh, it was from definitely, it was, it was not a hard stop. I admire okay. people who have the cojones for a hard stop. <laughs> Um, wow. I do. I am not a huge risk taker in that regard. I also have financial planners as parents, and so they would kill me. And so <laughs> I, <laughs> I had a a slow ramp. I would call it a ramp up. Uh, I did about. Okay. It took me about six to seven years. So the nice thing about freelance work is you, while it's feast or famine, that can be like not so great. Uh, I actually started to transition out. Um, so what I did was I had freelance work, but I would start to, um, at a certain point in the program, when you're done with drawing and you're going on to painting, oftentimes the instructors will say, Hey, is, would you possibly be interested in teaching? You know, we could use a couple more people who could start new people. And so what I did was they asked me, hey, would you want to start teaching the bar drawing now that you're in painting? And as much as it definitely did not pay as good as my graphic design work and my video editing work, I knew that was going to be a step towards, you know, I'm, you know, I was always looking for the step towards. So I said, okay, well, what if I, I'll have to work more hours um, to kind of compensate for like not taking this one job, but still having these other jobs. And, um, so I would teach, I knew it would make me a better artist in general, right? When you're teaching something, it makes you better at it. So I started to teach and I was still doing freelance work and painting. Um, and at one point, I think it was 2013 or 14, um, the director here knew she had to be in Europe for two years. And she said, I need somebody who can help run the school while I'm gone. So it's going to be an assistant director position, which would then continue after I get back as well. And I knew that was kind of like my trigger of like, if I take that job, I know I can do it because running an art school, small private art school is very similar to having to run yourself as a business. So I know I can market myself. I know how to work in professional relationships. I like spreadsheets and, um, you know, I can deal with a lot of the stuff. So when that position came up and I like raised my hand for it, uh, it was a natural fit. And so, um, something that is incredibly important to me and especially in my art practice is I, thought at one point in my life, Hey, I'd like to transition to like only doing painting all day, every day. The problem with that is you have the burden of having to make sales. Right. And I knew that that is something that my personal creative practice could not survive because that's a really heavy burden. And so I did not feel comfortable having painting sales be part of my needed income. And so when I was teaching and I was making some money and still doing freelance work, when the assistant director position came on and I said, okay, this assistant director position is roughly a certain number of hours a week. And I can know I can make this much plus I can teach that will cover the majority of the bills that I need to pay. Right. And so to me, I was like, that's, that was the ticket out. So I would just slowly start saying no to any new jobs. And that took about six to seven years in total from when I like decided I wanted to be that it was possible (laughs) with my capabilities. Um, But I also, you know, I said yes to the right opportunities that came up, even though it was going to mean more like work for me, but that allows for me to have, to pay my bills to, and to also have the freedom to make the work that is 100% genuine and uncompromising in terms of what I want to be making. And the irony behind that is that is the work that tends to sell the most, but you can't plan for that. 
So, right. you know, it's different for everybody. And I don't think there's one right answer, but for me and my like stress about money and my stress about, um, being able to have a sustainable art practice, it was incredibly important for me to have an income that doesn't rely on sales. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think going all sales, uh, is, yeah, it does put a lot of pressure, uh, on the work and, there's sometimes, I mean, cause you're, you know, one, one thing I, at least I talk with that brings, that comes up a lot of times when I'm talking to uh, students is that, you know, they want to do a certain type of work and that work uh, takes a lot of time uh, to be able to do it justice and time is money. And so you have to be able to afford to do, to produce that type of work. And there's a cost to pr pr producing each piece that you do. Um, and, you know, you have to kind of like weigh that balance. And I think, um, you're, you set up your, your, your life so that you can produce that, that, that type of work. And it doesn't cost you in, um, the, uh, you don't have to compromise the piece in order to make it happen. It's, it's, you know, right. what you want. Um, because I'm, I'm sure these pieces aren't a la prima. You know, uh, just just from the looking yeah. at it, that a three hour sesh, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, and I actually well, I did well, record. So, on, and I, I do have I do yeah. have friends who like that's all that's you know I really admire when people are able to make amazing work and have it be their sole income. Like that is, you have to you have to like be militant with yourself. Like you like that, and that's that's you know, everybody's really different. And I, and I really admire right. people who can do that and still make amazing, creative and highly skilled work. I just know myself and that just in my brain, it just wouldn't like compute. Yeah. And, and, and like you, you were saying there, there's so many factors, like you have to be, you were realistic with yourself in the sense that like you needed a support structure in order to support yourself, to be able to produce the work. I mean, the work you sell work, uh, but it's, it's, uh, you're, you're also doing things to help support the production of that, that artwork. And, you know, um, you know, some people have, have that support already built in, you know, to like their families and things like that. And that's awesome. Uh, but you know, others don't like, I know I don't. And so like, I, I set up my life so that I can have my costs low and, um, do things like illustration and, and teaching to be able to do the work that I want to do the way I want to do, like you were saying, um, because you're right. I mean, like, what if uh, you do a piece and it's, you know, it's a good piece and it's a successful piece in your, your trained eyes, but it takes four months to sell, you know, uh, that, that's sort of the reality or that a lot of months or six months make. are, or four months to make. Right. Right. Exactly. Like you, right. So like it takes four months to make. And then what if it doesn't sell? Like I've had paintings uh, that don't sell for a year, you know, like you just don't, there's no rhyme or reason why paintings, you know, sell or don't sell, you know, sell fast or don't or take forever to sell. So like, you know, that, that, um, erratic, um, sort of pace is, um, you know, that inconsistency can, can be, uh, really stressful uh as you know uh as an artist so like you have to kind of set you know you're saying like you know you have to set up ways to be able to mitigate that uh as much as possible and so um and you, you've solved that in in terms of uh teaching and i think that that actually lets you, you know, um you know like you were saying like in b you know your work b it's work i i think that that's that's like important like if it won't, it won't kill you if you, unless there's like a show deadline, obviously, but it won't kill you if an extra week is being spent or extra two weeks is being spent on it because you know that it's going to make it, make it good. And uh, I've, I've told my wife, like, um, you know, when, when I've, I have my life sort of set up in a way that allows me to do that, I like my work more, you know? Yeah. Um, I think when I'm out, out of balance, too much unreasonable pressure gets put on the work and it, it it suffers because of that, um, because you're just worried about, you know, what what's, oh, I hope, you know, like, it's hard to paint a painting and worry about, like, 
I hope this sells. I hope this sells. I mean, it comes, it comes in my head, but like, if you have that enough, I mean, you, you end up just not wanting to make the work and it becomes more of a burden and something that you don't look yeah. forward to. And then, then you exactly. ask yourself, why, you know, why did I get into this in the first place? Um, I can go be miserable doing something else that's more yeah. lucrative, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And actually people uh, act, ask me that they say, do you get sick of painting? And honestly, the answer is no, never. I think I'm like you in which I need to do it. I, I always talk about how I need somebody to come up with a word that's like hangry, but for painting that if you don't paint, <laughs> you, get, you turn into like the Hulk and it definitely yeah. <laughs> happens, but I never get sick of it because I, I do what I do because it's something that is kind of innately being driven by myself and it's not driven by outside factors and the minute something does become driven by an outside factor, I kind of lose momentum. It's very easy yeah. for me to kind of lose interest if I feel like it's become something that's not driving from inside me. Yeah. And, it, you know, that's, that's, it's really good that you, you had said that because you, you're really in tune with like what your needs are and who you are as a person that, that takes a lot of introspective uh, thinking too, right? I mean, like, it's not, not something that you just wake up and understand. And I think what the, the important part that you said was that every artist is, is different. Like there's no, I used to think like in early on in school, I would see my teachers and I'd, I'd say, wow, you know, okay. And, and have like this fixed idea of how to become successful uh, as yeah. an artist. And then when you get out into the profession, you're like, it's just, there's there all go. sorts of combinations. <laughs> <laughs> that are just wacky and um you don't you don't realize it until like you're you're in the thick of it uh but you you have to kind of you know any combination whatever combination it is just make it so that you can make yourself happy and uh be able to produce the the work that you you do uh want to do because if you if there's a piece that takes you a year to do and you like spending a year doing a a, a piece of artwork then you've got to be able to support yourself mm -hmm. throughout that year and, 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 uh, beyond, you know? So, um, in terms of your time, I, I was meaning to ask you about this. Like, um, I know this is such a loaded question cause I know it varies based off of just like, um, the temperament of the painting as I like to call yeah. it. Like, are, you know, are you going to give me a rough time today? I mean, you look nice, you know, like, do we have an understanding? Like I have this, like, like, like internal dialogue with this, with my paintings a lot of times, you know, like, you know, like we're cool, right? We're cool. You're not going to flip out on me and yeah, you know, cause me pain, you know, but um, just to give like the, those watching like an idea of, you know, how long this stuff uh, takes normally um, for you. I mean, what's a ballpark in terms of like beginning uh, to end? Cause I, I'm going to tell you right now, I think like, I, I look at your work and I'm thinking like the setup alone, yeah. So yeah, and like, I, I, can, I know I know how long yeah. it'll take me to set that up. You know, it's it's um it depends. Every piece is different, obviously, but I actually legitimately tracked the hours and minutes of a single painting, uh, and it was Amazing. just the painting sessions. And I mean, it was a larger painting, so it was about nineteen by nineteen. It's not up on the website yet because I don't have it uh, varnished yet. But if you look at the skull one at the very top, that one's 16 by 16. Um, and that, um, so the 19 by 19 painting that is kind of similar in complexity, um, that's a slightly larger, just the painting part of it took 186 hours. And wow. that's not unusual, um, but it is a little bit larger. Um, honestly, I would say the most uh, time expensive. Uh, and the most emotionally expensive part of a painting is the setup. And that is because it doesn't matter how well I paint it. If it's a shitty setup, then it's not worth painting. Right. So right. I, if, if, if I'm, if I start a painting by putting paint on a canvas, I'm finishing it. 
right? right. So I, there's no point in which I just say, eh, I'm not interested in this anymore because I've spent the time up front with the actual conception of the idea and the process and the studies and the, uh, and the, in the setup, the actual idea behind the setup. So that if I put paint onto the canvas, it's going to be done. I finish like 98% of the things I start. If it's a still life, it gets completed. So there's a lot of stuff that gets set up, but doesn't, hasn't gotten started or hasn't been completed. So there, you know, that's where this, that's where, you know, ideas will come and go and evolve and change and go into the trash can, but the painting hasn't started yet. So I do a lot of work up front in terms of the setup and ensuring that the idea is solid before I even consider even doing a color study like that. So I won't even do a color right. study until the actual setup, like there's something that I call it the goosebumps moment that I'm like, this is it. It's ready to go. Like there might be different iterations that could be possible, but I need to find one where I'm like, that's it. Right, right. At that I think that's it, man I I completely understand what you're talking about like I because like I know early on I would just it's amazing how little I it I went into a painting with you know when, when I had just like okay there's a piece of reference or like I think I'm just gonna go paint this and then you know yeah. I'll I'll make it cool if I just keep working on it you know and you realize that the longer, at least for me, like the longer I, I study this stuff, the more I realize like how early on all of this stuff has to be decided. And there's got to be a process that has the things that have to be considered. And at least the, the, the painters that I like um, love and I look up to, they were like most of their stuff was done all that thinking, all the hard, most of the hard work was done in the preliminary stage uh, yeah. of it. And, but, you know, before the final paint touched uh, the canvas and that's why the stuff looks so, you know, this, this, you know, this is like incredible. Like, and everything's, you know, a ba wonderfully balanced in a way. And like, there's, there's this asymmetry to it. There's this uh, uh, variation in texture. I mean, like all of this stuff, you, <laughs> this is not just some, random random right. thing and um uh and and i think that that's uh i don't think a lot of people that know that i mean it's not important that the viewer uh, for me at least if the viewer doesn't know that that's fine i mean w what matters is that they're experiencing this wow factor you know and get a get a connection to it but i think as an artist like you you know like you were saying like you you have to i think the first step is like being really excited about painting this thing because you know how many how many times like if uh you've painted something that you were like eh about it like in the early days and they yeah. just abandoned it you know and like as a professional like you can't afford to do that i can't afford to like <laughs> say like hey this 30 by 30 36 by 36 painting that's on the easel <laughs> i don't know halfway through if it doesn't work out whatever i'll just abandon it you know like it's a real yeah. Uh, you know, there's a real issue if that that happens, and uh, absolutely, you know, I appreciate. That, you, I mean, that's, you, that's, you that's that speaks to how that the idea at the at the start wasn't. It either wasn't you weren't excited enough about it. The the actual painting of it. I mean, some people get a lot of gratification out of, of just the act of painting, and and I think that's right. amazing. But I feel like if I'm losing, if, if that's the case, I'm not going to, you know, I can't lose interest halfway through. And that just means that I didn't spend enough time in the beginning. There's, there's tons of stuff that may, may make it to the cutting room floor, uh, but they just never make it to paint. And that's because like, you do have to try out the bad ideas. Like you have to try them out. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the early work, you have to do quantity over quality. You're just got to like pump out work to see what, what triggers your satisfa satisfaction or gratification of the process and the content. And you've got to like find those pieces that you really love how they came out so that as you go down the line in your career, or just like in your portfolio, more of those hits are going to happen because you kind of already know what is going to keep your excitement. So in the early 
days of creating, there's going to be a ton of stuff that you lose interest in halfway, or you finish it and you're like, well, why did I, that, like, that was pointless. Or like, that's just, right. you know, I still have a couple paintings that haven't sold <laughs> that are sitting around where I'm like, eh, it's like, it's okay. I should have just taken more time with like finding cooler objects or like maybe really, really thinking out the composition better or like right. fully considering all parts of the canvas and not just these like three objects that I put in it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you're, you're like uh, to paraphrase a good friend of mine's like you're um, the current paintings you're doing are, are uh, sit resting on top of the bones of just, you know, discarded paintings, you know, the paintings that have died off, you know, that, that, uh, that had to perish in order for you to get here. And, uh, yeah. I, I think there's also like, like you were saying, like, there's a distinct difference when you're learning, um, between painting and picture making. Um, yes. at least in, like in my training, totally. like I remember painting from life. Okay. Being able to compose what was in front of me, understanding that and I got good enough to do that but then when I was asked to do a picture that was a composition I just completely folded over and I was like I was looking at my hands like what happened what happened guys you know I thought we were you know we're good and uh very different you realize it's a whole whole nother art form yeah and and it's like the stuff previous is to prepare you for this to give you the tools necessary to execute it but you know this is not just like you know, your, your still lives are meticulously composed and have an, you know, uh, 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 this really wonderful quirky narrative to it, which I, I absolutely love in, in your work. And I love just like the fact that I have to go into it multiple times. Cause every, every time I go into it, I, I notice something new, you know, um, I was, I was just looking at this and I, I noticed that there was, I didn't even realize there was a self portrait down here. And I've looked at this thing a bunch of times you know and and just like uh yeah, not, yeah it's just just lovely but i just love also i just want to geek out about like the flow of the lace that goes into the archway oh that's so good that's, <laughs> i you know what you know, i didn't even notice like, that <laughs> really it's like a beautiful i was just like oh wow yeah. wow julie line this thing up you know? <laughs> so just take the credit i'm like man i will totally like, did that on purpose yeah. <laughs> yeah it just just everything has just got this wonderful um asymmetry to it like you 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 look at look at the, the i just love the variation too between just even like the the pieces of tape and the one that you know this little the shadow that's that must have been exciting when that when the light hit that oh man that i mean that gets me excited just to look at that <laughs> like i would like love to paint that right um Actually, the shadow yeah, of the skull, the shadow of the skull with the teeth, like that yeah. actually, like that little like translucent shadow section. I don't know why mm -hmm. it was actually incredibly easy to paint, but it was like, it's one of those things where you're like, I even impressed myself there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that's that's uh, leveling up, you know, that's like, yeah, that, that's cool. Actually, this, this one yeah. was originally supposed to be in a circular frame. So I had originally planned for this to be oh. in a circular opening. And then, so this is probably one of the only paintings in which I switched gears a little bit later. Like in, I was like probably doing the second layer of paint and I decided that I'm, I mean, I always consider all the way to the corners anyways, even if it's going to be covered up by an arch or a cir circular frame. So I just paint straight mm -hmm. to the edges, just in case you never know if a future collector is going to want to frame it in a square frame, whatever. Right. So I paint which, hap which happened to me all the time for some reason. Like the collector's just like, no, I'm putting it in a different frame. And I'm like, thank yeah. goodness I <laughs> I paint it to the edge because that would be yeah. pretty awkward, you know. <laughs> yeah. So so late in the game, I was like, well, you know what? I'm gonna like I I've decided to put it in a square frame. So fortunately the leopard print was all the way to the edges. Um, but I felt like compositionally the corners, the, the left corner felt just felt off. Right. And mm -hmm. I, I actually put a lot of weight on abstract concepts when I'm thinking composition, it's not just like, here's an object in relationship to another object. I'm also thinking shapes, angles, spaces, 
uh, tangents, all those types of things. So like when I'm feeling oh. something is off and it's usually an, kind of an abstracted concept. So I felt like it with the square frame, the weight was too much to the right. You've got the brighter objects off to the right-hand side and it's kind of this cascading information to the right. So I late in the game, put that little sticker in the bottom left-hand corner. Amazing. And that was something I was Amazing. like, wow, I can't believe I'm doing this so late in the game. <laughs> it's like, I'm a rebel. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the interesting thing about like, um, looking into, like, I'm a huge fan of people like Solomon J. Solomon and, um, you know, Harold Speed, like, just reading anything I can get on like the 19th century, I'm there, right? And yeah. reading like, um, do you know uh, Ramon Hurtado by any chance? Um, he's um, so. Oh he's wait, they uh, do. Is he also a tattoo artist? No, um, at least I don't know. I don't think he is. Um, he's got. I'll, I'll I'll link you. I'll send you his okay. his stuff. He's got this like great Instagram um stories of just like uh that that chronicle he's done like a ton of research on just uh uh the training at the ecole the beaux arts and you know in paris and stuff and like he has uh and a lot of like jerome's um uh atelier students as well like their their first hand accounts and i'm just like he'll post them on his stories and i'm just like looking through every single thing like you know looking for like a this uh <laughs> this nugget of information but it's really amazing how at a certain point they they speak to just like when they talk about picture making and, and things like that and, and and putting together images it it actually is like reductive in a, in in the language in a sense like it's not like about the object it's about the shape that the object creates and mm -hmm. being sensitive to that and it's almost like you have to know all this stuff before you understand that really truthfully, like be able to analyze. Cause all you see, like if I, if I know the untrained me, I still remember that uh, that person would look at the leopard print and just think, Oh, it, you know, just not, not be like, just overly fixate on the object itself rather than the shape that it's making. Uh, and so I wouldn't have been able to see, like if I were painting an image like this, the fact that it was too weighted to the right, um, you know, or, or be able to know that there's some sort of composition, I would just be worried about making it look like the thing that mm -hmm. is is in front of me. And I think that that's, uh, I, I've always found that uh, interesting, because even my, my thinking these days are just is just more like, yeah, uh, in, in that realm of like, flow of shapes and understanding, like, you know, oh, like, you know, designing things like a, I don't know, like a hand or a finger, or like a stroke, a uh, brush stroke, or I mean, a piece of like a, a still life object, you know, and understanding the flow of it and how that affects the viewer's um, relationship with the image and how they, they enter in and exit out of it. Um, it's, it's really like you're curating, when you get to that point, you're really curating the viewer's experience uh, as an image maker. And that's like, it, it's hard to put like um as structured of a at least for me like a structured of a, a um a mindset on it like it's not like a block in a first pass like that's just like the tools to get you to this point and then when you start to think about it it's you have to think about it in almost like uh it sounds irrational and it's hard to kind of put into words because it's like a pure visual language thing um yeah. And I also and I, find that's uh, why it's hard to, I find it's hard and I sometimes not shy away from it, but I don't feel as confident maybe teaching th things like composition. And that's because I feel like it's in a way a very guttural, fit, not guttural, is that the word I'm looking for? Like it, yeah, it, yeah. you have to kind of have so, this yeah. like reactionary like feel to it. Like there's it's not even like there's rules. Like we talk about light logic being rules and uh, the way that you use the materials are rules and fat over lean, right? With composition, there are 
there are tools, there are rules, there are like languages in a way, but they're all in a way intended to be broken. And so, and that's where you kind of have to, that's hard to guide. I find it very hard to guide people through because I always say like, well, if it were me, right. But I'm also reacting to the things that are really exciting for me to see when I see certain, you know, you know, there's the rule of you shouldn't have tangents, but like, I'm actually making a whole painting and I have done a couple of paintings where I'm purposely trying to do a lot of tangents in order to create a specific effect, right? So there's, I find it harder to corral information about composition because it is so almost so abstract of a concept and you can study and see what you like and you can kind of work in that realm and see, you know, how you can push the boundaries of that. But it's it's so challenging because there's so much less of like a right and wrong type of thing. Um, so I just right. find that I don't know if you have that same feeling as well, but I just find composition oh, yeah. to be a lot harder to feel confident about teaching or helping to guide people in a way. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's you know, I was lucky because of my I, I learned it. it's a lot easier for me uh for me to absorb information about composition through my training as an illustrator, because we were held by the narrative. And so like the narrative was the, like the anchor point from which we composed from. And mm. when you get into personal work, it, it doesn't have to be narrative. And so um, it's more so like what gets you the feeling of it. And then that's right. It becomes super personal. Like uh, tangents are bad because they flatten out space. And that's maybe a concern if you're trying to make things three-dimensional, but what if you want the space to be flattened in the first place or create tension in the first place, or like having more than one primary, you know, breaks harmony, right? But, and, and it, it, it causes the person, you know, it causes this sort of like unpleasant reaction, but what if you want that? Like, how do you go about controlling that in the composition? And I think that that's where it, it comes like personal and it, it ends up like uh, uh, becoming a personal journey of, of, of the, you know, specific artists and they have to kind of surround themselves, I think, with artists that will help them get there. Um, yeah. And, you know, for either from history or from, you know, contemporary. And uh, I find like, depending on the type of work I want to do, uh, that changes all the time for me, you know, cause I, oh, yeah. I get, you know, I'm, I'm like looking at, you know, for landscape stuff, I'm looking at certain artists and um, still lifes from from other. And sometimes they're you know, they're not ne not necessarily like uh, oh, still life artists only for still life. You know, like there's like you were saying, like it's all it, it's it it doesn't matter. Yeah, they're just shapes. You know, at yeah. the end of the day. So like, um, it and it sounds like we're we're talking crazy. I mean, at least the way I think. You know, like I'm hearing myself because as a student. I had this um, teacher, great, great, one of my greatest uh, teachers. I was this um, teacher by the name of Zhao Ming Wu. And um, he was from the Chinese Academy. And he was an incredible figurative painter, and still is. Uh, but he would, he he told me one time, he's like, I think of the figure as a landscape. And I was like, uh, maybe Zhao Ming, I don't know. I mean, it's a little early. Like, did you not have but your coffee? You did it. you hit your head? But I get it now. I get it now. And it's like, of course, it's a landscape, you know, like, yeah, that's the, that's the, the best way to Hello. think about it. Yeah, I know. Right. And you're just like, well, Ray's lost yeah. it, um, you know. Um, and so, but so don't you think certain information comes to you at different times? So one example is I think it was what book did I, it might have been it was not an honorary book. It was the art and practice of oil painting. Harold Speed? Yeah. I think it was Harold Speed book. Harold so Speed, I tried yeah. reading that. Yeah. yeah, I tried reading that the first year of my training. And it was like reading a book in a different language. And so when I came back to it after I had started the painting program and had gotten through like one or two cast paintings and then came back to the book, it was like a completely different experience. And it was so helpful because I had. I was like ready for the information. And so I do find that right. there's certain times, whether it's like, you know, 
a technical thing like that, but also in terms of, you know, being able to reference something like the figure as a landscape, you can, it can, it can come to you, but you don't fully understand the breadth of what that offers you until you're ready for it. And until you yeah. are ready for that information to like bring you to a different level. And so I think, you know, that's why I'm always on the lookout for just kind of collecting information or perspective or um, ideas or concepts, because I know that right now this feels like it might be something, but I'm, I don't feel like it's, I'm ready for it yet. And then eventually yeah. a year or two down the line, I'll like go through a sketchbook, which, which for me really just becomes a list of to-do things. Um, but I'll go through old sketchbooks or I'll look, open my Google docs to like my orphan ideas um, thing. And all of a sudden, like a bunch of things will jump out that totally make sense to either connections or I never thought of doing still life. Like, like the, I saw this portrait. I really liked that portrait, but what if I took that and made it into a still life? So there's, you know, that information comes and I think the important thing is to grasp it and then, you know, kind of have it in your library for like when you are ready for it. Yeah. Isn't that a, a beautiful thing though? Like the fact that, you know, you might not have been ready for the information, but when you are, it opens up a whole nother world. It's, it's, um, I remember talking to some friends when I was learning and every single day, it felt like the people that we loved, you know, the artists that we loved were getting better <laughs> every single time because you were learning, you, you know, you know, what made them good, what made the artwork successful. And, you know, that's just like, it constantly happens. And, um, I for sure know that the stuff that I'm learning now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, I probably came across uh, it earlier on. I just wasn't ready for it. And, um, right. that, you know, that's great stuff. And, you know, talking about, uh, sharing, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about like on your two things is that you're, you are a model example of that. And your blog, uh, on your, your site is, um, uh, just incredible. Uh, just looking at, um, progression and a lot of the behind the scenes stuff and understanding like the stage of, of an oil painting, I mean, all this stuff is, is you're just so wonderfully displayed and, and, um, presented, um, you should teach, Julie. No. <laughs> well, you know, it's like the, so, the yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a place for I'm using it as a place to bookmark information, like permanent information in a way, because I feel I mean, obviously I'm on social media and but social media is fleeting. Eventually Instagram's not gonna be a thing. Eventually Facebook might not be a thing. So I do think that there's in a way I'm trying to have like a, a return to the blog. Uh, but for a place that I can have, you know, free and accessible information that I find really help. I found really helpful. So both my YouTube channel and my blog, I'm trying to just have like information that's easy to access. It's all out there. There's nothing like complicated about it. And I try to walk through some really simple stuff that I found, you know, changed the game for me. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money uh, to learn some super basic things. I think that information should be available to anybody and everybody, you know? So right. I try to have a lot of, of, you know, videos that I would give my own students. Here's how I tone a canvas. Here's how I would start a drawing. Here's how I would uh, do a color study. I try to have that information on my YouTube channel, but also my blog is more uh, permanent information where it's not a video and you don't have to spend time. You can just kind of click through and, um, so like, I'm just actually starting the, the one I just posted a couple days ago was somebody asked, I posted a video on Instagram and someone said, Hey, this would be really useful to do with other colors too. And it was how I test out my paints. So I prize familiarity wow. with things. I say, how, you have to understand the personalities of your paints and what they do. So here's how I test them out. 
And so I, somebody said, you should do this with all the colors. So I said, Hey, that's actually a really good idea. Um, so I was going to do this on my own anyways, but I did this with like the blacks, all the black paints that I have here at my studio. I just said, you know what, I'm going to put this in a more formalized, uh, format. And I, you know, wrote down just what I thought of the paint in general. So that if somebody else is like, well, I wonder how this black compares to, you know, Windsor New and Ivory Black. So I just put my general opinions up there and it's just basically like, here's my opinion. This is what I'm finding. You know, this, I like this because I like, you know, smoother paint. So I think it can help people. Hopefully it helps people to um, not miss buy, you know, like when you just buy something, cause you're like, well, I wonder if whatever. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's really helpful. You know, I've, I, there used to be a, a forum called, I think it was like the rational painter back in the day. Yeah. And it was, yeah. <laughs> it was really, helpful. I was on that forum. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. just painters kind of helping painters. And so I, I'm trying to do my part to, to participate in continuing that tradition of just painters, helping painters. I think that that's like a, 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 a wonderful thing that you're, you're doing that. Cause I know like, that's how I, you know, uh, received a lot of information was some artists saying like, check out this painter, they're sharing this thing. And even beyond school was like all of these, these, these painters, just I'm looking at blogs and looking at videos and, um, and just sort of paying, paying that thing forward. And yep. And it's also just helpful for yourself just to to do it as well. I think, you know, I think we're the same in the fact that we were so starved for the information that once we got it, it's like we wanted to make sure that any, you know, as many people as possible wouldn't go through what we had yeah. had to go yeah. through. I think because um, it, it's just, you know, if you're feeling that kind of like you're just lost, like there's no, you know, you can't feel the ground. and um, that's really just a, a horrible, horrible thing. Cause it could, you know, think about how many painters or would be painters it would have actually discouraged and they sort of Absolutely. never got entered into the field because they didn't even know existed. Um, right. Yeah. And I, I think your, your, your Instagram is one of my favorite Instagrams uh, on the platform. Uh, and I, I just love, I think I share as much as I can that comes across my, my <laughs> feeds because really you're just so it. great about, Oh, I mean, like, you know, it, it's just like I, I use the stories as a, uh, a like a temporary save for myself because I'm just like, yeah. oh, that's cool. I'm going to look at that later today. And so I'll just go through it and I'll just sort of stare, stare at things, you know, and uh, well, you, like, have, oh, you did... inspired me. like like the way that I use my stories is actually I took that from you is because I every oh, time really? you share like these like tw I'd see these little 20 dashes. I was like, oh, what's was Ray Sharon today? And I, it was like, I would find all this really incredible artwork that I didn't know about. And so I took a cue from that and I was like, I'm just going to start sharing all these artists I find that I think is incredible. And so it's like, yeah. it's, I get a lot of comments where people are like, thank you for sharing all of these artworks because they're not just like just realism. It's all stuff all over the place. It's illustration, it's right, abstraction. Right it's it's sculpture it's interesting videos you know so like i i totally copied you on that <laughs> so I, was like, I want to share all this artists well i'm i'm humbled i'm humbled i mean that that's i i started that the stories thing um because it was just like every day on instagram there's something that humbles me that's like man these there's so many good artists out there and okay. i i personally like love going on instagram and just feeling like I don't know anything about painting or art because like this exists in the world. And that's what like I love sharing because it's just like, wow, or like that's how I should, you know, maybe consider, you know, uh, uh, approaching things. And I've learned so much just from the fact that like the internet now is so worldwide. So like there's so many painters everywhere. Uh, and it's really, really awesome. And I followed a bunch of new people because of you. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's great. I love, I love the sharing, uh, the ability to share those things because that's what I was always doing with my friends, just with books and maybe magazine articles. Yeah. And now like it's that on steroids with the rest of the world. And I think that that's like so awesome. Um, and you know, an, I it just, really is so, amazing. 
It's an amazing opportunity. And it's just, it's, it's great to that. I love that you are showing a progression of your paintings too, from, you know, how you get to a finish because I I've, you know, I've met a, a bunch of uh, more than a few artists that aren't comfortable at all with that. Uh, they don't like, you know, uh, people seeing how the sausage is made, you know, <laughs> and because they're worried that people are just going to write them off or, or something ridiculous, like, because they, or make them feel like other, at least this is my assumption, you know, um, it's just a fear of like, not being taken seriously or thinking that what you do is good or yeah. not. And so I really appreciate, you know, you, you showing all that, that type of stuff, because it, it shows just a type of care uh, and attention uh, that, you know, you need to, that's, that was needed in order to execute a piece like this, that it just didn't manifest itself out of thin air. Right. And, um, yeah, and it's, I think it's that that's, not, um, it's, it's a little bit, I want, I want people to see how the sausage is made. And because I think it makes somebody more willing to realize that you, that it's not perfect from the start and is that it's a, it's a development. And so this, the being able to see the, you know, a lot of people will say that my ugly stages are quite lovely, but they weren't always, <laughs> but I, but having having the, pro I think it also comes from being a teacher. Like I have to be able to paint in front of people. I have to right. be able to take their challenge that is not going well. And I have to be able to deconstruct the problem they're having. And so I feel like sometimes the demo, the execution and the process itself is actually the most informative of seeing when I screw up or when like, Ooh, that's not right. Right. So I, I try to, um, I try not to create a glorified version of what I do. I'm tr I try to include like, okay, now I'm changing this. And then I change the shape and the, it goes down a little scratchy and it's thin and you can see through the paint for the first layer. And I try to explain what I'm doing, like my thought process, you know, so that it's important for me to put that out there because it's not that I'm perfect at it. It's that I am using paint in a way that I can control it at, in the stage I'm at. I'm keeping it simple at the very beginning and that this is doable. Anybody can do this as long as, you know, you are able to learn how to draw, as long as you um, use the paint in a specific way, like this is not, it's not rocket science. It's not magic. It's just being very purposeful and having an intention to every time you're touching the canvas with paint, you know why you're doing it. Well, I think that you showing all of these layers of, at least for me, has had the reverse effect in that I, admire you even more because of and it makes me feel like you know it shows me how just incredible you are you know and i i uh um so it's it's definitely at least effective in 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 my book and Thank i think you. it's uh something that i think a lot of uh, artists are i'd be i wouldn't be surprised if a couple of artists contact you you know later down the line and say like this instagram was you know, one of the reasons why I got into oh, you I know, uh, so. painting. So that yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. And so um, I guess uh, we're, we're coming up to the uh, end. This is, I mean, I could talk to you for another three hours, you <laughs> know, but uh, we, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like or part two of 27, you know, uh, you know, and so um, are there um, anything that you want to, uh, that's coming up for you that you, uh, wanted to sort of plug or anything like that, or let people know about? Um, I mean, I, I'm always having random rotating shows happening. So I'm participating in a couple of shows at RLS gallery, uh, which is an incredible gallery. Um, and they show a really amazing, uh, range of work from uh, you know abstract work to surreal work to expressionist work and to realism. And I think they show some really interesting, cool stuff. 
Uh, I'm also going to be in, in a show at 1261 in October with some of my painting heroes. And um, awesome. Uh, and so I'm so nervous <laughs> to like to paint, to have work hanging alongside them, but I'm trying to be confident, trying to like work on that. <laughs> Um, so I'm excited about showing, uh, next to some of the people I admire most who are living painters, uh, that's coming up in December and it's a show called tight. Awesome. So it's like high definition realism. Uh, awesome. and then I'm always, you know, I'm always teaching. I have, uh, random workshops. I have a, a workshop at snow college in June, a still life painting workshop. And I always have workshops here at ARA Boston and, um, I'm always teaching at the school in general during the semester. So like, I'm, you know, it's easy to stay up to date with what I'm doing with either my instruction page or um, that's usually where I try to like list everything that I'm, um, any classes I'm teaching. And, um, but, you know, other than that, like, I'm just always trying to just continue to make, make, make and, and create new works that are exciting for me and, and hopefully for other people too. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Julie. We really, I, I mean, I really appreciate you taking out time to, uh, in your busy schedule course, to do this. Of course, this and been, in the uh, part two, we'll get to the illustration masterclass stuff. Part yeah, two. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, part two, because we, yeah, that that's a whole nother like geek out session uh, for me, yeah. you know, uh, and, uh, but th thank you for um, answering my questions and sitting down and, and uh, chatting with me. I know that I'm, uh, after this, you know, I'm, I can't wait to get back into the the studio and and uh, and and paint. So, and I'm sure other people uh, feel the same way. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Julie, and um, thank you, uh, John and Timmy. Uh, if you're uh, haven't done so already, please uh, like and subscribe this video. It really does help uh, reach out um, or, or 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 increase the reach out or the our reach for these videos and uh yeah feel free to check out our, our previous episodes as well there's a lot of amazing artists and um yeah have a great night julie and uh thank you everyone for